living with vision. And uh, I'm going to pick that theme up, and I am going to continue that message for the next number of weeks. I just want to take my time and just bite off a thought and just have us chew on it because I really believe that, <clears throat> particularly in the hour with the challenges that we are facing, um, God's people need to recapture the Lord's vision for their lives. And that, believe, that begins with you recapturing God's vision for your life, knowing that the Lord has a purpose for you, and, and the seeing of that purpose is what we call vision. And the Lord wants to show you that vision, or He wants to remind you of it. He wants you to expand, He wants to expand it, and it's important that you see that. And so I'm going to be sharing some things that will be directed at helping you um, see and understand and pursue and encourage you to pursue the fulfillment of God's purpose, God's vision in your life. Um, I'm going to take my, my thought this morning from the book of Esther because there's a lot of people in the Bible um, who are wonderful examples of people that God gave a vision to. And the vision he put within them um, just transformed not only their life, but more importantly, the lives of many people around them, sometimes whole nations, sometimes whole empires. Um, and that's how God moves in the earth. He gets somebody's attention. He, he plants a vision in them. As they turn to him, as they obey that vision, as they allow it to crystallize in them, God moves through their life and does a great work for the benefit of other people, begins to touch other people, and whole nations are turned around. Well, when I think of that, one of the, one of the great, great testimonies is that of Queen Esther. So let me give you a little background, and then we're going to just take a look at one verse in Esther chapter 4, verse 14. Esther 4 and 14. Esther was a just a, 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 an average Jewish girl who happened to be blessed with extraordinary beauty. She was beautiful and caught the eye of the emperor, the emperor of the Persian Empire, Xerxes. In the Bible, he was called uh, Ahasuerus, and Xerxes wanted her, and so when the emperor wants you, he gets you. And she became one of his wives, one of his many many wives. So her, her simple life was picked, snatched up, and dramatically changed. So she's put in this unique and favorable position in the kingdom of the Persians. But shortly after that, there's a man who is a uh, counselor, an advisor to Xerxes, his name's Haman, and he's just about as anti-Semitic as you can be. Hates the Jews and, for some reason, just wants them annihilated. Now, the Jewish people have been assimilated into this empire. And throughout history, we've seen that happen. Empires would rise, assimilate nations, assimilate tribes. And so whole nations and ethnicities would be assimilated under these empires. It happened in the Greek Empire, it happened in the Roman Empire, Persian Empire. So the Jewish people are subjects of Xerxes. Um, Haman, the advisor to Xerxes, hates the Jews. So he devises a plot to have them literally annihilated, all put to death, by advising Xerxes to order a law that everyone had to worship him, knowing that the Jews would follow the commandments of God, of which it was prohibited to worship man or to worship false gods. So naturally, they would not bow to that statue of Xerxes and worship him. And as a result, they would have to be put to death because they would be directly disobeying the emperor's orders. And so Haman figured, I'm going to get rid of them in no time. So he couldn't wait for them to start disobeying the emperor. And sure enough, his plot worked, and he runs to the emperor Xerxes, and he says, they're disobeying you. They won't bow to worship you. 
and they're disobeying your word, they're coming against you, and he appeals to that emperor authority, and of course Xerxes says, all right, round them all up and put them all to death. Now that will obviously include his wife, his new little gem, Jewish gem of a wife, uh, Esther. So <clears throat> Esther has an uncle. He's a godly and a wise man. His name's Mordecai. And Mordecai comes to Esther and says, do you realize what your husband's done? Inspired uh, and tricked by Haman, he's fallen into this plot and he's ordered the death of all the Jews. And her response was apparently, as you read the, the text, was, well, there really is, is not a whole lot that I can do about this. Uh, the wives of the emperor were forbidden to just, they couldn't, for example, just walk into the den and say, hey, <clears throat> hey I, I need your attention for a few minutes. I want to talk to you. They had their little wifey area where they lived and the emperor had his quarters. They could not go into the throne room just because they were wives. They couldn't go before him. They couldn't have an audience with the emperor. They had to be summoned. They had to be called. And so Esther says, well, unless the, the emperor, unless the king calls for me, I can't appear before him. And if I do, I risk being executed. I can be executed for just standing before the, my husband, the emperor, and getting an audience with him. Mordecai says back to Esther, he says, well, um, I'll assure you of this. If you don't do it, then perhaps God will bring deliverance some other way, but you and your father's house will not survive. So it brings us to Esther chapter 4 and verse 14, the, the statement, the verse that I want to bring out. This is Mordecai advising his niece Esther. And in the midst of the advice, he has this one sentence that I want to extract and I want us to look at. He says, it may very well be that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Wow. It may very well be that you're alive and in the position that you're in because of a set of conditions you didn't even know about, you didn't even know were going to happen, but God did, and God moved you into place at a special time. Who among us hasn't had the thought that you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this? If you haven't, you need to, because God ordained your life. God brought you into the world at the specific day that you were born, God ordained your birth and has a plan. He has a purpose for you. There is a reason why you are in this world at this time. So <clears throat> let me just open up by saying your future isn't out there. You're not going to go find your future out there. You can make a future, but you won't find your future out there. Your future is in here. And as God begins to show you your future, the vision that he gives you is going to come with four elements. Incep inescapable desire, number one. When that vision comes, it's going to bring open doors. When that vision comes, it's going to come with special words for you, and it's going to come, fourthly, with specific sacrifices. So today I want to take just that first thought that when the vision of God begins to, for your life, begins to arise, it's going to come with inescapable desire. A desire will percolate inside of you that you cannot get away from. It will be overwhelming because you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So think of Esther. You know, aside from her personal desires and expectations that she might have had now as a wife to the emperor of Persia, Mordecai stands before her. And she's probably thinking, wow, I got the royal credit card. The mall opens at 10. 
I can't believe it. This is just going to be awesome. What a great life I'm going to have. And so Mordecai comes to her and challenges her and says, we are all about to be annihilated. And he challenges her to desire the purpose for which God had positioned her in the kingdom. A purpose she knew nothing about. And one she probably wouldn't have chosen if left to her own. <clears throat> God's purpose in your life often comes as an unseen purpose that's somewhere in your circumstances. Right now, in your situation, right now in your circumstances in life, you're looking right at the purpose of God and you're not seeing it. It's unknown, it's unseen, but God wants to bring it up. And he wants to show it to you. And we often think that my purpose in God is seven states away, three countries, a continent, or ten years in the future. Your purpose is inside of you, and God wants to bring it up, but he needs to show it to you. Because it's as yet unseen, and many times it is embedded in the circumstances around you. And you see them as benign and, and just routine. But God sees a great opportunity that he's placed you there in this time to address that opportunity. And as God begins to bring vision up in you and cause you to see that unforeseen purpose, you will begin to divert and refocus your own desires in order to pursue it. You'll have to take your desires. That mall trip's going to have to wait. That shopping experience or maybe some of the mundane things are going to have to be set aside. Your desires are going to need to be redirected. The vision's going to call upon your desires to be redirected into this position in the kingdom. Praise the Lord. But if you do, if you do realign your desires with God's purpose, it will release an inescapable desire in your soul for its fulfillment. A desire that you don't have, but it'll rise up and it'll begin to take over your life. You know, God knows that in the face of great resistance and danger, it takes inescapable desire to pursue God's vision. But if you take your own desires, whatever level those desires are right now, and begin to aim them towards God's purpose, then the Spirit of God will begin to ignite a passion in you for God's purpose. You know, everyone who knows they have a purpose with God and everyone that begins to see that purpose in them, they begin to realize that they have a sense, every one of them, that they have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Every believer that I've ever met that knew what their purpose was had that sense about them. I have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. God wants you to walk through life fueled with inescapable desire for God's purpose, on fire with passion to fulfill them. So if you allow that to happen, God's inescapable desire is going to take over your life. Amen. So there's four things, there are four ways in which the inescapable desire that God's purpose, God's vision in your life brings, there are four ways in which that vision will take over your life. Number one, it pushes. It pushes everything else behind it. In Genesis chapter 30 and verse 1, Jacob's wife, Rachel, uh, kind of like Esther, she's beautiful. Jacob loves her. He's married her. But then he also had to marry her sister in order to get her. And she wasn't so good looking, but man, she could have kids. And Leah was just every year cranking out a new baby, but Rachel couldn't have children. And in those days, a wife's sense of fulfillment purpose was in the children that she was able to bring into the world. 
And so Rachel, though beautiful and though favored by her husband and prosperous, had everything a modern woman in our culture would love. All the advantages, the love, the adoration, the money, and no children to have to deal with. Uh, her situation would have literally been pounced upon by modern women today. But she was miserable because the one thing that would give her a sense of purpose was eluding her grasp. She was barren and she couldn't have children. So in Genesis 30 and verse 1, Rachel cries out to Jacob. And when she saw that she bore no children, the Bible said that she cried to Jacob and said, Give me children or else I die. Give me children or I have nothing to live for. Now this angered her husband because he felt like all the love that I give you, all the advantages that I've worked so hard to provide you with don't mean anything to you. He didn't understand what was going on in her. See, she knew that her life had worth or value only if she could fulfill the purpose for it. And the vision of God's purpose in you becomes your reason for living. And you cannot, like Rachel, you cannot be consoled with diversions or alternatives. They just won't do. It takes over your life. It's the vision or death. And that's what Rachel was saying. Give me children or else I die. It's the vision or death. There's nothing in me that feels alive if I am not fulfilling the purpose for which I was born. She was right. She was born to have some children who were born to become mightily and greatly used of God and their descendants. So the first thing that the inescapable desire of God does as, as you lay hold of the vision God gives you is it pushes. It pushes everything else behind it. Which brings us to number two. The second thing, the inescapable desire of God in your life to fulfill that vision does, it seeks its own fulfillment in everything that you do. Psalm 27, one of my favorite verses, verse 4 says, as David writes, One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. You think about that statement, it's pretty amazing. David was a man, he was a musician, he was a shepherd, he was a prophet, he was a warrior, he was king, he was a military leader, and he was an appreciator of women. And uh, so David had a lot of interests. But this man, who is kind of a renaissance man in his day, makes this remarkable statement. He says, one thing, not a bunch of things, not third or fourth, one thing I have desired, I have a passion for, from the Lord, and that I will seek after. Everyone say, seek after. Yeah. So the second thing that that inescapable desire to fulfill God's vision in your life does is it seeks its own fulfillment in everything that you do. The vision of God's purpose in you will seek to dominate everything that you do. Seeking the fulfillment of your vision is going to convert everything else in your life so that no matter what you do, there will only be one thing that you actually do. Now think about it. No matter what you do, no matter what job, function, interest, hobby, no matter where you go, you're always going to be doing the one thing. David said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that I may dwell in the presence of the Lord all the days of my life. And yet David knew that as a king, as a warrior, and, and as a husband of several wives, quite an extended family, he would be called upon to be busy doing a lot. But he said, no matter what I'm doing, my desire to be in the presence of God is going to convert everything I do to being in the presence of God. I'm going to do the one thing with everything that I do. So you cannot compartmentalize the inescapable desire. It will not stay bound. It's jealous. It's going to take over. It's going to rob everything you do and make it a slave 
to the one thing that God's called you to do. The inescapable desire for God's vision has often captured people with multiple talents and distilled them down to one-trick ponies. Listen, you know some of, you know some one-trick ponies. Now, these are people who are like the Renaissance people. They sing. They do art. They are athletic. They're intellectual. They have opinions about everything. And they're capable of doing four or five or more things very well. They're well-versed. They're well-prepared, they're well-trained, they're well-educated in all kinds of different matters. But the vision of God with its inescapable desire rose up in them and turned them into one-trick ponies. They don't get invited to a lot of social events. You don't invite them to your parties unless you want to hear their vision because that's all they're going to talk about. Are you listening to me? Your vision, however if you follow it, will take you to amazing places that you can't imagine, that you couldn't imagine you would ever do. When you are a person who allows and allows God to percolate and develop in you that inescapable desire to fulfill your purpose in God, um, you may find that you are not very popular because you are a one-trick pony. You just eat, drink, breathe, sleep, Jesus, and whatever form of expression that Jesus is producing in your life. It's the one thing. Praise the Lord. Brings me to number three. With the inescapable desire to fulfill God's purpose in your life, to pursue that vision and to make it a reality, the third thing that it's going to do is it forgets. It forgets. It has a huge back door in its memory banks. It forgets everything that it has left behind. And speaking of the inescapable desire to fulfill God's vision, Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 14, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. I'm running after this vision. This inescapable vision, I can't get away from it. I'm pursuing it. I haven't yet hit the fulfillment mark. But this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. I cannot reach ahead if I am living in the rearview mirror. I must forget everything that I have passed by in my life. It's done and it's behind me. The inescapable desire to fulfill God's purpose in your life is going to wrestle inside of you to free itself from all of your past hang-ups. Let me say that again. I'm going to use English this time because I've envisioned a much more profound response uh, when I said this. So I'm going to say it again. The inescapable desire to fulfill God's vision in your life is going to wrestle with you to free itself from all of your past hang-ups. And it deserves to have a clear living space. It deserves to have all those past hang-ups in your life, wiped and out of there. It's always going to demand that you forgive, forget, and move on. People that walk with that inescapable desire cannot afford to keep unforgiveness in their life. They can't afford to be mulling over, going over and over, following that same track around that same mountain over and over again, that she did me wrong. He was unfaithful to me. They didn't see my worth. My upbringing, my friends, the disappointments of my life, over and over, reliving, rethinking. They're occupying, they're renting space in your life, and that's why. 
The vision of God has not crystallized within you. It doesn't have enough room. Your heart, your mind, your imagination is too full of the things that are behind you. God's calling you forward. Forgive it. Forget it. Move on. That principle is not a suggestion if you want God's vision in your life. It's an absolute necessity. When the prophet Elisha was to succeed the great prophet Elijah as his predecessor, and Elijah called him, the Bible says that Elisha, who was a farmer, and Elijah goes up to him in the field as he's plowing with his oxen and his yoke, and he calls him to follow him and to succeed him as the, as the successor of the prophetic ministry of Elijah. The Bible says that before he could follow him, Elisha took the yoke off the oxen, broke it up, and made an altar and started a fire and sacrificed his ox. Now that's his livelihood. He now has no job to return to. He just sacrificed the job. There is no going back. Jesus told his disciples, if you take your hand off the plow after putting your hand on the call that I've given you, you're not worthy of the kingdom. That's tough. I don't know how many people would be considered Christians today if we really did apply the standard of Jesus to discipleship. Jesus said, having put your hand to the plow, if you remove it and look back, you are not worthy of the kingdom. God believes that the inescapable desire to do his will in your life deserves, deserves <laughs> to forget everything else. Put them in the background. Praise the Lord. Lot's wife, when God delivers him from Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, don't look back. What did Lot's wife do? She looked back, turned to a pillar of salt. Brings me to the fourth, fourth and, and final characteristic or fourth and final thing that inescapable desire will produce in your life when you make the vision of God the most important thing in your life. It risks. It risks you for its fulfillment. That vision wants to live. That purpose wants to live. And you know what it's going to sacrifice in order to have its way with God? You. It risks you. I, I, one of the greatest examples of this is Esther. She says, she says to her uncle, once she has allowed this thing to sink in and she's absorbed it, and she's considered, wow, you know, I thought I was just getting married to the emperor to have an awesome life, but I'm in the middle of this life and death drama, and now I realize that my one act, my one imperative is that I have to go before the king, and I have to tell him about Haman. I have to talk to him about this plot. I need to try to turn him around. Even if he doesn't order my execution for simply taking an audience with him when I haven't been summoned, surely when I bring up the issue of his trusted advisor being evil and tricking him, I'll, that'll surely do me in. She risks her life. And so she says to Mordecai, all right, I'm willing. I can see it. I have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. She says, I and my handmaidens and my whole household, we are going to fast and pray for three days. We're going to seek the face of God. And then I am going to call an audience with my husband. And I'm going to go into Xerxes. And she said, and if I perish, I perish. Who? glory to God. I love that woman. I love that attitude. I like that heart. I wish Christians today thought like that. I wish we really acted like that. I wish we had a backbone instead of a wishbone. The inescapable 
desire to fulfill God's purpose in your life will grow to a certain point where it becomes so big it risks you and you don't care. If I die, I die. We scratch, claw, fight, argue, get into scraps with loved ones, with our family, because we don't have our way. We don't have our way. We do everything and anything we can do to preserve ourselves. Meanwhile, is the purpose of God growing, multiplying, being fruitful in your life? And there you are, preserving self. Doing everything to keep yourself from getting sick. Keep yourself from becoming poor. Keep yourself from becoming forgotten. Esther said, if I die, I die. There's something, listen to me, you're not going to like this, but I'm going to tell you. There are things in life worse than death. You can't tell that to a 21st century person in our culture today because they literally worship. They worship the little bit of real estate called life that they have and at any cost. The value, the moral value, the fulfillment or the unfulfillment, immaterial. We are called today, we're demanded today, we're taught and our children are being taught in our schools that we should bow and worship life in any capacity that we see. It must be respected. And I understand, you know, what's, what's being suggested, but there's a point at which there are things that are worse than death. And apparently, God thinks that a wasted, unfulfilled life is worse than death. Because he shows it throughout the scripture. He's always looking for men and women who will allow that inescapable passion and desire to fulfill God's purpose in their life to make them step out and risk their life to go where God tells them to go, to do what God tells them to do, to say what God tells them to say. Never, never allow self-preservation to get in the way of living your purpose. The Apostle Paul said, I die daily. Did you know that Paul said, I die daily? Every day I face death. Every day a piece of me falls off. Every day uh, my emotions die a little. I'm disappointed. I'm discouraged. I'm cast down. But the Lord keeps picking me up. I will not let go of this inescapable vision God has given me. It's costing me everything. It's pulling everything off of my life. But I'm living an adventure no man or woman could live. In the high jet stream of the will of God. A life that 2,000 years later, when women have baby boys, they name them Paul. When's the last child you saw named Pilate? Nobody names their kid Pilate. Look at little Paul. He's adorable, isn't he? Who'd you name him after? The Apostle Paul. Paul's remembered 2,000. We, more people have read the Apostle Paul than any other author walking the earth. Yet Paul said, I die daily. For that unique position in human history. Don't you want your life to count? Don't you want your life to have purpose, to have meaning? You know, there's nothing more grotesque than seeing somebody professing to follow the Christ of Calvary living for themselves. It's an anomaly. It's a living oxymoron. It doesn't make sense. It's strange. It is grotesque. Someone who says, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I am following the Lamb who laid his life down at Calvary, and yet everything you see about them is self-preservation. Worried about themselves, taking care of themselves, thinking about themselves. You never see self-sacrifice. You never see the recklessness of a man or a woman who believes the vision in them will bring them through the storm. And if they die, they perish. So what? Those are the people that God has invested his kingdom in. 
I know it's gotten a little quiet in here. I realize that, but that's good. This is good medicine for us, amen? amen. The inescapable desire to fulfill God's vision will make you inspiringly brave. I'll tell you, the times that I have stepped out and just cast care aside for myself, and there were other believers around, others with me, they created moments of inspiration in people's lives that will carry them through life. They, they set a high watermark, they set a standard that people look at and they say, that's what I think of when I get into trouble. When I face a situation, they look around for people like that. They read books, they, they go on the internet, they look for people who have ex inspiring tales of bravery, who have risked everything. You can't just run around and act uh, with boldness. You eventually have to pay up. You have to earn that boldness. You risk yourself, and people will take note because that's what Jesus did. Here's our altar call this morning. You might be sitting there wondering, <clears throat> how do I get my own desire in my life as it, such as it is at the moment? How do I get it to mature in my desire for God's vision? How do I get that to mature into this inescapable desire? that you're talking about that has these qualities? Well, the answer is, take your own desire, whatever level it's at right now, aim it at Jesus, and commit it to following Jesus as your shepherd. Now, you might be saying, I wouldn't be sitting here if I hadn't done that. I don't always assume that, and I also don't always assume that just because you made that decision at some point, that you're still making it every day of your life. Take that desire that you've got, focus it on Jesus, and commit it to following the Lamb. And I'll tell you what will happen. God will take that and he will explode it into inescapable desire as he reveals his vision in your life for you. Because Matthew 22 and 14, Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. Is that because God really only wants a few? to really be significant in his kingdom. No, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but God wants the whole entire human race to come into its glory and to be filled with his love and filled with his grace. He calls many. Why is it that only a few were chosen? Because they choose what God chose. When God called, they chose the calling. You see, God does not have a forced marriage with you. A good marriage is one in which you choose each other. You make an appeal. You call. I am calling. I'm on my knees. I've got the ring in my hand. I'm calling. What do you say? You could say no. You could walk away. You, you could postpone and just kick the can down the road another year, two years, five, until eventually it falls apart and you never do have that awesome marriage. There's the call. What do you do? You choose the call. And when you do, you enter into that exclusive relationship. I now separate myself from pursuing others. I choose you who chose me. Paul said that I might apprehend that for which Jesus apprehended me. That is how you take your desire and let God turn it into a burning, inescapable desire and passion that will cause you to fulfill God's vision in your life. And with this thought, we're going to pray. Remember this, don't forget it. This young Jewish girl, Esther, who by all estimations, other than being extremely beautiful, didn't have any other extraordinary powers or abilities except that she found herself, not through any works that she had done, in this unique position in the kingdom at that time, but because she let God put his vision for her life in her heart. She was willing to see it, and she pursued it 
inescapable desire rose up within her. Then God took that girl and through her spoke, spoke to the emperor of the Persian Empire. If you haven't read the story, you should. It's an awesome ending. Because after she goes before Xerxes, he, he welcomes her and he asks her to come. What do you want? And she tells him, lays it out, risking death. And when he found out, you see, that wasn't just a pretty wife talking. That was God talking through her. When you let God talk to you, when you talk to others, God talks to them. This girl let God talk to her, and she had vision. So when she spoke to her husband, the emperor, God opened his eyes. And he hanged Haman on the gallows that Haman had built for Mordecai. And so the reason I tell you this is because our world is filled with Xerxes in different levels, in different places. All over the world, there are people who want to annihilate others. There are people who have power and have authority over the people that God is interested in. Someone needs to talk to them. Someone needs to go to them. God has put you in the kingdom for such a time as this. You have been born at this time to be influential in the purpose of God. The people out there in those neighborhoods and the people around you in your realm are waiting to be delivered from the gallows, set free. It's going to take an Esther. It's going to take somebody who says, if I perish, I perish. Because God, the love of God, the power of God will fill that person. And when you speak, God will turn those heads of authority. That's when you start seeing revival. That's when you start seeing things change. Close your Bible, stand with me.